Good afternoon, everybody. We're just wait, waiting for our virtual waiting room to load in and we'll get going in just a minute or two. So Chris, you are our, our guy on the tech, just um, keeping an eye on our waiting room. Just let me know when you think we're, we're loaded in and we're good to go. So um, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, regional Manufacturing Outlook webinar brought to you by Make UK in partnership with BDO. And um, firstly, may I offer my sincere apologies that last week um, our originally planned uh, time for this event uh, due to technical unforeseen circumstances we've had to postpone. So we are recording today's session and we will be making sure that that recording is freely shared with those uh, who are unable to join or for those that wanted to share it with colleagues. So as I say, uh, this is a webinar brought to you by Make UK um, in a long-standing partnership with BDO. Um, my name is Charlotte Horobin. I'm the region director across the Midlands and East for Make UK. Um, and it's my pleasure to, to chair today's session. Now, every quarter for a, a number of decades now, we've worked together to produce um, economic data on behalf of manufacturing, what we call our Manufacturing Outlook Report. Um, however, during the summer, we also do a deep dive, which is what we're going to focus on today with a view very much on the Midlands region. And that's what we call our Regional Manufacturing um, Outlook Report. In terms of today's agenda, we've got some brilliant speakers for you. So I will begin by taking you through those key stats, what, um, what's going on in the both East and West Midlands. I'll then hand over to our partner, John Gilpin, who represents uh, manufacturing at BDO across the Midlands. And then we've got three brilliant sector overviews. So we're representing sectors that are very important to the future of the Midlands. First of all, we'll be touching on uh, MedTech with Professor Mike Hannay. We'll then be featuring uh, advanced materials with Tony Kinsella. And then we'll be thinking about future mobility. What does the world of automotive look like for the future with Philippa Oldham? Throughout today's session, there is the opportunity to ask questions through Zoom. You will find that there is a Q&A function. So please do feel free to add any questions in there and we will do our very best to get back to you on those points. Now, a health warning, I'm not an economist. Whilst I live, breathe and love manufacturing in the Midlands, uh, we will be able to give you those anecdotal bits of evidence. However, if you do want to come along and hear our quarter three economic outlook, um, results and also to engage with those clever economists that we've got in our team, please can I encourage you to join our quarter three manufacturing outlook briefing that will take place on the 21st of September. Chris will make sure that all delegates today get a, an opportunity to sign up to that event. So let's get to business. Let's have a look at the scores on the doors. And here you can see uh, the balance of output and orders over a number of quarters. Uh, this is our quarter two set of results. So if you look on the far right hand side, you can see there that positive balance for both output in red and orders in orange. Now, this represents the percentage balance of change. So this is those that are up minus those that are down. And then we get a, an overall uh, direction of travel as opposed to magnitude of change. So what else do we know? Well, output volumes for um, UK orders have seen significant expansion, actually the highest in our manufacturing outlook history, and that's dating back to the 1990s. Export orders have exhibited positivity following uh, what was a very suppressed quarter one, both domestic and export price rises. Um, however, margins really have remained in that negative territory, and that's been the only metric to do so. Both employment and investment have exhibited strong positivity, and the expectations for quarter three are remaining very optimistic. So manufacturing output for 2020, we saw a contraction um, of 10% in the sector. However, for 2021, our teams are forecasting growth of 7.8% for the manufacturing sector. 
Now, for the wider economy, the team are forecasting 7.5%. So just marginally ahead, uh, we suspect that manufacturing uh, really going, you know, through that, that big boom period that you can see there in quarter two is just going to overtake the overall growth of the wider economy. In terms of the regional snapshot, recent indicators have shown a renewed optimism. But is the growth that we've seen so far in 2021 enough to recover the losses that we saw in the back end of 2020? Not necessarily. Many regions have reported con uh, contractions and there was only the Northwest actually that showed uh, average positive balances across all of the indicators that we measure. Official statistics have interested some you know, key developments whilst the relative contribution of the sectors, whether you be in manufacturing or other services, has remained relatively unchanged. There has been a key difference, and that is our observation that there's been a change in the region's destination of exports, and that's a decline mainly to the EU. So this highlights the impact that we are working our way through um, of EU exit. But assuming that we can return to business as usual, I'm not sure what that statement means anymore, our economists do forecast that we will return to pre-pandemic levels um, of output by the end of 2022. So let's just have a look at um, this chart that just shows you those key indicators that we measure. So output orders, investment, employment, and then forecast looking for that three months ahead. And this, again, is the percentage average balance of change between quarter three 2020 through to quarter two 2021. Now, that's really important because that time period shows or it included two very difficult quarters of struggle one quarter of transitioning to growth, quarter one this year, and then one of explosive growth, what we've witnessed in quarter two this year. And, you know, um, I'm sure John will touch on some of those supply chain issues that we've all been observing and wrestling with. The result, though, has been a lot of single digit um, positive and negative uh, balances coming through. The, the grouping of these figures that you can see in front are pretty tight. We have got an anomaly, the east of England, which is a geography that myself and Chris Cork and our regional manager um, also cover, is showing some uncharacteristically negative balances. But in the period of five quarters, the last five quarters, this survey has displayed the worst and the best results in a 30-year history. So I don't think it's a surprise that some of our averages perhaps are being knocked off balance. Some great news for us today, though, the West Midlands um, has remained the top performer for maintaining output. Um, and the East Midlands has posted double digit balances for investment. Um, but it's also the region that has improved its investment outlook the most. So hopefully this isn't just short term. This is plans for the future. So here's a brilliant map of the UK and this showcases the average business confidence indicator and again this is between quarter two 2020 um, through sorry forgive me quarter three 2019 through to quarter two 2020 so that presents us with the average for a 2020 figure and um, through to 2020 quarter three um, through to this summer Q2 2021 so in simple terms each region has a confidence balance the average that we sense checked in 2020 versus the average that we've sense checked this summer in 2021. Now, the dark blue areas show positive relative change all the way through then to the light blue, the light orange. And then those that are exhibiting dark orange show um, the negative, most negative relative change. Now, if we'd have looked at this map last year, I would have been a little bit more subdued because the East and West Midlands were the only regions showing dark orange, that negative confidence. Um, and this just showed how COVID-19 and EU exit had ravaged particularly our transport equipment supply chains that span the whole region. However, this year we can see positive relative change in both the East and West Midlands, and isn't it lovely to see them there shining in blue? So let's have a quick trip into each of our regions. So firstly, um, the East Midlands. We'll begin on the far right hand side because I love these infographics. This just shows the diversity of manufacturing in the region and as you can see there, food and drink manufacturing coming in uh, at 22.6%, 
followed by transport equipment manufacturing at 13.7% and then rubber and plastic um, and non-metallic minerals coming in there at just um, over 10% with then another 53, 54% uh, clusters of the manufacturing. Now this, what I want you to take away, we've got a really diverse region and very important that food and drink is a, a big player within the region because it's notoriously one of the most resilient sectors. Whenever you go into a recession or a difficult time, we still eat, we still tend to feed the kids, feed the dog. The patterns in which you do that may alter, you might not go out for dinner anymore. And of course, COVID-19 absolutely stopped us from doing that. You may stop buying certain brands and, and perhaps move more to own brands, but they, uh, food and drink really does offer that resilience. If we look at the uh, stats that you can see, there are 264,000 manufacturing jobs in the East Midlands. That's 27,000 jobs uh, fewer than the year prior. Now, I'm sure the job retention scheme um, is still skewing and uh, clouding what the true figure is here. A very, very important stat now for the East Midlands, 11% of the region's total workforce are employed in manufacturing. This is, um, and the East Midlands has always boasted the highest proportion of people working in manufacturing. We've got a rival this year, Yorkshire and Humber actually are giving us a run for our money because the employment levels in Yorkshire and Humber are very similar to that in the East Midlands. And funny enough, their um, sector footprint isn't too different. They've also got a lot of SMEs, they've also got um, a lot of food and drink manufacturing taking place. 7% of the UK's manufactured exports come from uh, the East Midlands. 48% of those exports go to the EU. That's actually down from 49% uh, last year, which is something I'd already warned about in the, our previous slides. The top markets though, we talked about the EU, 48% of exports landing there. Asia 24%, North America 14%, and our manufacturing productivity unfortunately is quite low in the East Midlands, so it is 91.6% of the UK average, and that it makes it the second lowest actually in the country. <clears throat> Excuse me. If we look at the table um, at the bottom, this shows the percentage balance of change from quarter one this year through to quarter two. And the, um, the arrows, hopefully you can see that they just show the direction of travel. So you can see the balances there and just that direction of travel. I don't think it needs much more explanation. So at the height of the pandemic, the output balance in the East Midlands fell to minus 43%, but the latest figures are showing an expansion of 27%, which is just below the UK average. Uh, the East Midlands economy does make up 5.7% of the UK's output, um, but manufacturing makes up nearly 16% of the regional output, which really is very much above average. Investment intentions um, is not only the biggest improver, but it is the highest in the UK. And as I've already stated, those intentions for the future are also very promising. So we've got strong signs. Um, within the region, very much attributed to that diversity. We've talked about food and drink and the resilience that that sector brings. Um, and overall, the East Midlands 2021 regional outlook uh, boasts the second uh, highest average confidence and that second only to Wales, which is positive news. So let's jump across the M1 for a moment into the, uh, the West Midlands. And again, we'll start on my favorite infographic on the right hand side, just demonstrates there probably no surprise, transport equipment very much dominating um, as a sector, 35% there. And then metal products and machinery equipment closely following on. And I think it's very fair to point out that those two sectors are absolutely feeding into that, that transport equipment piece. So it really does highlight a contrast to the East Midlands where we've got that diversity and much more focused sector um, over in the West Midlands, which is great when times are, are going well and, and people are buying cars and transport equipment. However, if we do hit economic challenge that you know um, proves difficult for the automotive sector, that then puts the region potentially um, at more risk. In terms of the key stats, 292,000 manufacturing jobs, so not dissimilar to what we've got in the eastern side. That's 12,000 down from last year. Again, job retention scheme probably skewing those. 10% of the region's workforce are employed in manufacturing and 8% of the UK's manufactured uh, exports are coming from the region. Overall, the EU uh, accounts for 46.3% of exports, actually a bit of an anomaly. This is up from 45.9% in the West Midlands and the top markets, EU, we've talked about 46%, 
North America 24% and Asia coming in at 17% third position. Manufacturing productivity a little bit better than what we saw in the East Midlands, but still below the UK average at 96.7, uh, the sixth best in the UK. And then that table at the bottom right, Q1 through to Q2, the scores on the doors and also um, those indicators have all moved in a positive direction. So the West Midlands economy is making up 7.3% of the UK's output and 15.4% of the regional output uh, is coming from manufacturing. So again, very similar to the East Midlands, way above that UK average of 10, 11% um, of GDP coming from manufacturing. Um, the West Midlands are previous, uh, are previously, um, as previously referenced, boasts the top performance in the UK regions um, for the average output balance. Um, and it didn't see the depths of the de decline that actually the UK average saw across um, all of our different regions. Orders were maintained um, and we did see a positive average balance over the last 12 months. Um, contrary to the East Midlands, however, those investment intentions are the second most negative. Um, employment has sadly declined deeper than the UK average, but it has actually been outpacing um, in the recovery during the last quarter. So overall, the West Midlands has got the fourth highest business confidence in the UK. So I hope that that's been a, an insightful romp through the stats as they uh, stand today. But right now, it's my pleasure to introduce John Gilpin, Head of Manufacturing at BDO across the Midlands for his commentary. Thanks, Charlotte, and good afternoon, everybody. It's really good to, to talk to you all today. I don't have any um, snazzy slides like Charlotte. I'm just going to chat for a couple of minutes about what I'm seeing out in the in the sector. So very briefly, I, I head up BDO's uh, manufacturing team here in the Midlands, uh, and I also happen to be an audit partner with more than 25 years experience, and, and the majority of my clients are in the manufacturing sector. As the world has unlocked over the last few months, I've been getting out and about and, and spending time face to face with my clients and walking their factory floors, which has been something I've really missed as we've been stuck in our bedrooms, as I am today stuck in my bedroom. But, um, so it's been good to get out. And, and there's a couple of things I just wanted to share with you that I've been picking up uh, as I've been talking to my clients, uh, two, two key themes. Um, first of all, skills. Um, we just saw from Charlotte's slides that, that confidence is up, output is up and orders are up. One of the challenges facing manufacturing them is that they don't have the people to, to fulfill those orders. Of course, we, we, you know, we, the skills shortage in manufacturing has been long trailed, initially fueled by Brexit, but then impacted by furlough and some of the difficult decisions that companies had to take in the, in the dark days of, of the pandemic, where there was permanent fixed, uh, permanent uh, cost reduction and headcount reduction decisions taken, which were the right decisions to take at that time. But as the world has opened up again in the last, say, six months, and those orders have flown back in, manufacturing businesses are really struggling now to, to get those orders out the door to their customers' requirements. Um, and are having to think really flexibly about how they deliver those orders, both using technology or, or, or being a bit innovative about shift patterns. But it's, it's, a, it's a, real, a real challenge for the manufacturing sector. Secondly, and this is perhaps more a slightly narrower perspective, but, but I want to talk about chips, not the chips we have with our fish, but, but, but microchips. Um, many of you on this call will be aware that um, there is a shortage, a capacity shortage of, of microchips, uh, not just here in the UK, but worldwide. It, it was born uh, when the uh, chip manufacturing factories overseas predominantly went into lockdown 18 months ago. When they started generating capacity again, all that capacity got hoovered up by the technology companies who were making laptops like the one I'm talking to you on today, which meant that traditional markets that use chips, such as automotive, um, were pushed towards the back of the queue. And this is this is really hit um, during 2021, during the beginning of 2021. And it's hugely challenging and hugely frustrating for the automotive sector in the Midlands. I don't know the precise number, but well over a thousand companies are involved in the supply chain to, to OEMs, automotive OEMs here in the Midlands. And, and many of those, what they do, what they make, doesn't have anything to do with chips, but because their end customer, the OEM, is slashing uh, production and production forecast, often at pretty short notice, that's creating huge instability and uncertainty uh, in, the, in that supply chain. 
And there's no quick fix to it. it. It takes a long time to build more capacity for production of microchips. And it also takes time for the OEMs, and, and some of them are doing this, to, to look at um, manufacturing vehicles that are less reliant on those chips. So from a macro perspective, there is no quick answer to this. So the uncertainty, I think, will continue into 2022 and possibly into 2023. And what am I seeing some of my clients in the automotive sector having to do? Well, having weathered the storm of the pandemic during 2020 and the early months of 2021, and feeling like starting to feel like they were coming out of it, the order books were flowing up again. They're now having to look again at things like headcount and, and cost management um, and make some difficult decisions um, be because there is such volatility and uncertainty about what, what the orders they're gonna need to fulfill are. And, and secondly, um, they need to, to, to get cash onto the balance sheet to give them some protection over the coming months and possibly years um, so they can protect some of those jobs and, and keep the business going. And, and I'm seeing that both in the form of debt and equity. From my perspective, it, it, as I've sort of alluded to before, it does feel particularly cruel for the automotive sector in the Midlands, which is such a key part of manufacturing here, to be having to, to deal with these blows after, after the last 18 months. So uh, the, the manufacturing sector in the Midlands is incredibly resilient, and I have no doubt that uh, these headwinds I've described this afternoon will be dealt with and will come through, but it is, it is a challenging time. And with that, I'll hand back to Charlotte. Thank you very much, John. And um, it's been really insightful to see that our regional boards that meet once a, a month virtually, but we've just welcomed the first physical meetings back for the last 18 months. The number one issue that they consistently raise without diverting elsewhere has been that volatility, the inability to forecast and plan for the future. So really um, interesting to, to hear that you're also detecting that. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. So we're now going to turn to our first sector specialist, and I'm delighted to welcome Professor Mike Hannay, who will be covering uh, medtech and, and medicines in general. Uh, Mike is the Managing Director of the Medical Technologies Innovation Centre at Facility, forgive me, at Nottingham Trent University. So Mike, pleasure to have you with us. Really looking forward to uh, the next 10 minutes with you. Uh, thanks, Charlotte. It's great to be here and great to be uh, talking to you as well about such an exciting sector in my view. So Midlands-based health and medical technology organisations are having a profound effect on our lives. Major advances are introducing innovative solutions to the way we are diagnosed, treated and cared for. And these advances are helping to improve the quality of our life, allowing us to live longer and are vital in meeting the challenges that our society will face from a growing and ageing population. And never have the capabilities of our region been better illustrated than during the COVID-19 pandemic. Throughout the pandemic, the Midlands has stepped up to support regional and national needs for medicines and medical technologies. Uh, and just a few examples. So the Midlands companies have been pioneers in the development of lateral flow testing technologies. So sure screen diagnostics as one company based over in Derby have produced a rapid antigen test kit that are supporting citizens and healthcare professionals, not just in the UK, but around the world. And I'm sure many people who are on the call today have benefited from some of those lateral flow tests. Uh, Midlands company stepped into the breach to provide high quality uh, PPE, the personal protective equipment, and equipment that fully complied with the EU, UK, and global specifications at a time of acute shortages protecting ourselves, our health and our social care uh, workers. And we saw real challenges, real challenges with the demand for PPE that was never been seen before. And also challenges that the sources uh, that we'd relied on in the past weren't working and bringing in um, equipment from outside of the region wasn't necessarily helping and fell below the standards. So Midlands companies really stepped up to the mark to make a real difference uh, for, the, for the NHS. Even before the COVID pandemic, the NHS unfortunately was no stranger to medicine shortages. The long list of medicines in severe shortages have included such basic uh, staples as anaesthetics, muscle relaxants, antibiotics and neuroleptics, all of which were absolutely vital during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the shortages were managed particularly well. It was really challenging. And a number of Midlands companies responded to the needs of the patients 
by expediating the supply chains of medicines. And I think one of the important things that's going to be uh, a future discussion with the uh, government is how we can make sure that we have robust supply chains, that we reshore some of those medicines and PPE supply chains at a time of national need. Just buying on the basis of cost and cost alone, I think has, has got to change where, we where we're faced with uh, pandemics. But it's not just the manufacture and supply of critical equipment and medicines that the Midlands has led the nation's response to COVID. Health and med tech experts across the Midlands are leading 81 new COVID-19 research programmes. The research that's done in the region is playing an incredibly important role in leading the Genome Sequencing Consortium and identifying new strains of COVID-19, not just in the UK, but internationally as well. The Midlands has used its internationally leading research excellence and clinical trials infrastructure to recruit 50,000, yeah, 50,000 patients to COVID-19 clinical trials, driving the discovery of new treatments and scientific insights. And through all, all of that, we've also been looking at how we can generate uh, research in the basic study behind some of those mechanisms. And we've brought in 45 million pounds worth of funding that's been matched, enabling 90 million pounds of cutting edge COVID related research to take place within our region, which is fantastic. We've been at the forefront of the early detection of heightened risks to the country's black and ethnic minority populations and making sure that that became a national priority. So how can we play such an important role? Well, it's really based on our strength and depth within the Midlands. There are close to a thousand med tech businesses operating in the Midlands the largest number of med tech companies in any region of the UK. And the industry sector contributes over 1.6 billion to the national economy, employing 23 or over 23,000 people in our region. And it's split, split broadly between the East and the West Midlands with, as you'd expect, centers in Birmingham and in Nottingham. There's also other clusters around Loughborough, Leicester, Derby, Coventry and Stoke-on-Trent. So it's pretty uh, widespread. And we're home to a wide range of industry and academic led research facilities, which puts the region in a position to lead the development of new med tech products, services and businesses. It's the perfect place for med tech and healthcare companies to locate. There are 27 universities in our regions, many of which are playing a leading role in the advancement of medical technologies. We have seven medical schools, 52 NHS trusts. 50 major hospitals and 25 at Science Park. And we're home to a wide range of medical technology companies from Salts Healthcare that was uh, established over three centuries ago and is still going through to the Binding Site Group and Pennine Healthcare, which are relative uh, newcomers to, to the um, industry, but are making a massive contribution. Um, we've also blessed to have Make UK to support the industrial footprint and the industrial manufacturing footprint, but we've got Medilink and two academic health science networks that are helping to boost innovation collaboration across, across the region, with Medilink supporting the connections uh, to industry so that we can support the bench to bedside development and manufacture of our new innovations. And the AHSNs, the academic health science networks, supporting the links between that research and medical practice to encourage the spread of innovation. So we've contributed a great deal to the whole of the um, COVID pandemic, but it's not been an entirely rosy picture. And we've seen pressures in the NHS as they've responded to COVID-19, which has meant that whilst demand for COVID-19 related treatments and technology has uh, grown exponentially, routine operations have sadly stalled and we now see uh, the longest waiting lists we've seen in a generation and probably since records began and that's meant that um, organizations that provide technologies to um, elective surgery which doesn't feel very elective if you're waiting for a hip transplant is really challenging our industry as a whole and hopefully those pressures will start to be relieved and I'm hopeful that the uh, new changes within the NHS will make sure that we address those backlogs and that the Midlands industry will be there to, to support us. Uh, we talked about skills earlier on and John was talking about the challenge for skills well 
uh, the med tech on top of a global pandemic has been replaced by a pandemic of regulation. We've had the medical device regulation and the in vitro diagnostic regulation introduced to Europe with greater challenges for the in organizations and for individuals within those organizations. And it's pretty clear at the moment that we don't have the skills necessary to, um, to address some of those challenges. And that's an area that I think we need to be working on, not just within industry, but with academia and training providers as well to make sure that our region is able to uh, continue to prosper and to continue to export to Europe, which is one of our major markets. The other market, the UK market, has also decided to change its regulations. So not only have you got new European regulations, you've got new UK regulations, which provides a, a growing challenge for our uh, organisations. The great news is, though, that we're still continuing to innovate and there's still great support for what we're trying to do. The supply chain issue needs to be addressed and we need to move away from what is commodity based procurement at the moment. And I'm pleased that uh, Make UK has been supporting both med tech companies and medicine companies to look at how we can build more robust supply chains, uh, not just for the uh, region's economy, but also to support patients so that they don't end up on second or third line therapies with worse outcomes. So I think that's a really important thing for us. I'm also pleased that the Midlands Engine is starting to address and support the healthcare issues and continuing to lobby for the acceleration of what is a really important sector. Uh, my organisation is a, a collaboration between universities, um, NHS and uh, industry bodies and our hope is to also continue to support people to enable us to take their innovations from the bench to the bedside. So it's been a very mixed picture throughout the, the last couple of years, really challenging one. I think the Midlands has really stepped up to the mark, but we do face uh, some continuing issues. But I believe our historic capabilities, our track record of uh, innovation and ability to respond to the needs of our nation at a time of crisis, make the Midlands a great place for the medtech industry and hopefully the place where we will develop new innovations that support the lives of patients and residents of our region, as well as stimulating economic growth. So thank you very much, Charlotte, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mike. And um, I think you really packed a punch there. I, I think the, the sector that we've just um, heard so much about very, very clearly, thank you to your, your commentary, um, is perhaps the unsung hero. It's not always front and centre, but of course has such a big impact for all of our lives. So thank you for delivering um, such a, a clear brief. Thank you very much. Um, next, we're going to um, be covering advanced material. So delighted to welcome Tony Kinsella, who is the Chief Executive Officer um, at Lucidian. So Tony, it's a pleasure to have you here today. You're a big personality in the UK <laughs> ceramics um, industry. Over to you. Lovely. Well, uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, and thanks for having me. And, and thanks for the plug, Charlotte. Uh, big ceramics, uh, big personality. Well, I hope I can live up to that billing. Uh, so a little bit about us, uh, really, just to try and put in context, we're, we're a consultancy uh, and around advanced materials, which covers some of the areas that, that Mike uh, uh, has talked about in, in MedTech and also with Philippa. So we're, we're a broad range. And, and our, our purpose is helping clients overcome the materials challenges and, and the, the processes in the business and, of course, reduce impact on the world's resources. And there is an opportunity for us all, isn't it? it it's a downside in that we're going to have to change how we make products, but there's also an opportunity. We've, we've talked about you know, the green dividend and uh, the, the green opportunity. Well, what are we? We're, we're a collective of scientists and engineers. We're a formal company, uh, growing international. But I, I do like to think you know, the, the difference for us is we've got inspired and engaged scientists and engineers. And uh, scientists and engineers can tend to be rather inward looking if we're not careful. It's, it's part of our, our nature, I think. Um, for us, the thing that we look at is, is commercial technocrats. And, and that's a challenge, I think, both from universities, you know, how do you add that academic rigor, but how do we get those bright young things to actually think about the world of business? Uh, because that's important to us, both as a region and I think as a nation. So hopefully we're, we're part of, of that solution. 
perhaps talk a little bit now about what we see and, and maybe some uh, lower number of statistics, but just some more qualitative feel. So we, we've seen in our industry um, very significant negative impact on civil aerospace. You know, our, here we are with Rolls-Royce on our doorstep. So they're not making as many engines because they're not flying. They're not breaking as many engines. They're not repairing as many engines. Uh, so that, that has made a significant impact on the supply chain. Uh, and we've heard a little bit about that. And then specifically here in Stoke-on-Trent, of course, the home of the potteries, the traditional ceramics. If we're not going out to eat, if we're not flying, if we're not taking cruisers, then who's taking tableware and, and dinnerware? Um, so that they, th those two areas have been particularly badly hit. Um, the civil aerospace, uh, I guess, until we see you know, probably more international long, long uh, haul flying, I think we're, we're still going to be in difficult territories in that. However, in every cloud, there's always a silver lining. Mike has pointed some, some of those out in the healthcare sector. We needed healthcare like never before uh, during the pandemic. But at the same time, some of their industries and sectors have really flourished. Um, again, advanced ceramics and energy, here we are. We've got a climate crisis. We know about it. Sometimes I hear the news and I think we're all doomed. Uh, you know, it's as if there aren't any solutions already in play, there are, we've got to step up and move faster. But just in, in our own uh, UK, Ceres Power uh, Limited, one of the world's leading designers of, of uh, fuel cells. They burn hydrogen, they make electricity, range extenders in trucks, certainly power sources, potentially in light aircraft, and eventually they're going to be the boiler, the heating source in our homes. So you know, this is a great UK leading company. It's world leading technology. It's licensing its technology around the world. And it's all about advanced materials. It's been built on some of the superb science that we have in, in UK uh, academia. So something the UK can be proud of. The hydrogen economy, again, being able to manage the hydrogen, make hydrogen. For those who don't know, I think at the moment we're up to about seven versions of hydrogen. I, I'm a chemist. When I went to school and university, hydrogen was H2. There was one version. Apparently there's blue, green, brown, pink, all, all news to me. But, but I think it is clear that, that you can't just pump hydrogen in. You have to think about how it's produced but technology is developing for the production of hydrogen, the storage and the application. I talk about civil aerospace being somewhat uh, depressed, but space hasn't. And uh, hopefully they're not listening, but I, I often call them the space lunatics. Uh, Elon Musk uh, and, and Jeff Bezos and, and even Richard Branson. You know, we've all watched and been enthralled with the new space race, haven't we? I think with uh, SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Orbital. Well, guess what? If you're going up in space, uh, you, you need new materials. You need ever more materials that can operate in very difficult, difficult environments. So that's been a great driver, not, not just for Lucidian, but for the supply chain, for academia and for engineering companies. Nuclear power, uh, nuclear has seen us all through. Uh, we, we need to keep the lights on. There may be a great debate about how overall clean a nuclear industry is, but certainly it doesn't produce CO2 at the point of generating your energy that keeps the light and the boiler working. Uh, and, and that's an industry that has continued now to develop. Wonderful, wonderful uh, developments in a relatively short period of small modular reactors. We all see the huge, great projects at size well and the cost overruns. But you know, the vision eventually is for small modular reactors to be more regional, more local. Uh, so less power losses in transmission. So again, these are all opportunities that are building now with engineering and, and science development. Healthcare, I won't go over again, really. Mike, Mike has talked about, but of course, it's not just in, in the um, vaccines, which have been so helpful. And I absolutely agree with Mike about PPE. You know, 
why we allow buyers to just buy on a single price point rather than the holistic pricing uh, of what it means to UK PLC. And John, you know, there's a challenge to the accounting industry. We need accountants in, in health service to do different sums. Uh, so I think there's a big learning uh, to be made in that. Home ceramics, a mundane in many ways project, but while we've all been sitting at home, we've been DIY with new bathrooms, extensions. So there's been a boom for the tiles and sanitary wear industry and also driven by construction. Uh, here we are, uh, the government trying to get through uh, building more and more homes. We've seen house prices increase. Um, but fascinated now to see the real uh, expansion of modular build, uh, homes built in a factory. We have one on our site. Uh, it came over two days on the back of two lorries, unloaded by a crane. And for those of my age, a uh, bit like Lego, you know, four clicks, in went the base, another layer, four more clicks, then the roof. Suddenly, you've got a house. Two days later, it's fully operational absolutely fabulous both in terms of speed but also in the in the reduction of waste back to climate change so all of these take technologies all of these take some invention uh, and innovation um, and this uh, country of ours and this region of ours is at the home of nearly every one of these technologies in the so fabulous future that there's I guess, been forced uh, to make industry think differently by COVID, by the pandemic. But necessity is the mother of innovation, isn't it? We all know that. So innovation has been driven harder uh, on, you know, as an upside of, of COVID. A, a great opportunity, and excuse me for, for making a plug, but here in North Staffs, we've just won uh, 18 million uh, from the government to support a 42 million investment in an advanced ceramic center. We're already the potteries and, and everyone knows what pots uh, do for us, but advanced ceramics are really at the heart. Uh, I think most people don't understand just how much ceramics we have in our bodies these days with hip joints, knee joints, with dental replacements, with yeah, finger joints, ankle joints. Yeah. Uh, we, we truly are becoming bionic in, in many areas and ceramics are at the heart of many of those. But, but if my party piece, how many ceramics are in a mobile phone? About 600, all advanced ceramics. Maybe if there were no advanced ceramics, maybe we'd be relieved from the plague of the damn mobile phone. But, but they're there and they're necessary. Um, aerospace we've talked about, that lovely jet engine that you see when we used to fly and we all thought it's nice it's turning round it's metal but it's coated with ceramics those metal engines would melt without advanced ceramics protecting that that metal from the heat that's great but actually if we want to make aerospace more uh climate uh acceptable in the short term Okay, there's inventions in terms of making electric engines for flight, but for long haul, we're still some years away. The only solution for us in the short term is to make civil aerospace ever more efficient. And of course, part of that is biofuels, part of that is you know, maybe hydrogen as a fuel source. But if you carry on with the existing fuels, you have to get those engines to burn hotter. Um, if you allow them to burn hotter, then they use less fuel, they're more flight efficient. The only way of doing that is ever more uh, improved traditional ceramics. And now we're at the stage where we have to develop those with computers. So computer-based materials technology using machine learning has really come to the fore in, in the last year or so. And, and I think that will drive materials development to the future. So all of that activity is going to start taking place here in, in Stoke-on-Trent. And the goal is that we become in this advanced ceramic center, a magnet for inward investment for high tech industries, high wage growth industries, uh, and that will help us as society and the country through the 21st century. Uh, and, and I finished with a quote, which comes from, um, 
Inamori, who's the chairman of, of uh, Kiyosira Ceramics from Japan. Um, and he sees advanced ceramics as one of the three enablers of the 21st century, uh, alongside information technology and new energy systems. So I'm proud to be sitting around one of the three pillars, I hope, of, of the 21st century. So I think hopefully I've given you some insight of the impact of materials, both on industry and society. For me, I think we've gone through depression in terms of people seeing downside. I think I'm seeing in the region a huge motivation uh, and, and a societal engagement from our younger uh, members of, of society. Um, in terms of skills and people, yes, we're, we're seeing lots of news about uh, skill shortages. At this moment in time, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed, we've been able to, to make great gains in the short term because sadly through the pandemic, all those great graduates uh, that had been lovingly trained and nurtured by Mike and colleagues, jobs were, were, were in short supply. Uh, and we've been able to, to recruit with, with ease over the past uh, six to 12 months. And we've, we've actually hired some brilliant talent. Um, long, not long may it rain in terms of the graduates not having jobs, but that supply chain we've all picked up, it is brilliant. Uh, it is important to us uh, in the future. So supply chain of bright, enthused, forward-looking graduates, um, innovation and obviously funding to drive innovation from the laboratory into the commercial products that we all need in our daily lives. So I hope that's been helpful uh, as a, a simple view of ceramics and the West Midlands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. And I'm sure you've absolutely broadened um, people's understanding. I certainly have learned um, a, a huge amount there. And if ceramics, as you say, they're, they're going to be one of these key enablers for the future. And we're seeing such significant investment to make sure that we've got that capability in the region. Wow, that really does make me feel optimistic. Um, moving forward. So last but certainly not least, we're going to, to feature um, future mobility in the automotive sector. So delighted to welcome Philippa Oldham, who is a director at the Advanced Proportion Centre. So Philippa, good afternoon and over to you. Just finding the unmute there. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, great to be here. Thanks for inviting me along. Um, and I'm delighted to say that actually, I think hopefully it's going to be some similar messages and actually a roundup of what we've heard from, from Mike, Tony, and John already. Um, so, really, I'm going to start off by doing a little bit of a quick introduction to the APC. I'm not sure how much of the audience will be familiar with us. Um, a little bit of an overview of the sector and um, impact over the last 18 months, but also then touch um, on the opportunities going forward. So um, as a little bit of an introduction, um, the Advanced Propulsion Centre was set up in 2013 as a joint government industry uh, activity and really because it was focusing around the opportunity around the strategic technologies and those are the ones in the petals that you can see in the middle. So thermal propulsion systems or engines, uh, electrical energy storage and energy management, so batteries, uh, lightweighting vehicle and powertrain structures and obviously electric machines and power electronics. There is intelligent mobility, so a lot of the autonomous vehicle side of it, and that's covered by our city organized Benzit. Um, around the outside, it kind of shows the, the activities that we're involved in, so collaborative research and development opportunities. So this is the late stage R&D working with the sector. Um, projects usually around 18 to 42 months, um, and currently we have our, our APC uh, 19 competition open that closes on the 6th of October. So again, if any of the, the the attendees want to hear more about that, then please, please get in touch. Uh, we have the Automated Transformation Fund. So that was um, announced last year in the budget, um, partly to support the industrialization of scale of the supply chain. You know, the recognition around batteries, fuel cells, power electronics, electric machines, that real product and process scale up and, and the fact that sometimes there needed to be the investment there um, to de-risk, but also one of the key technologies around that fund is, is recycling. So the recognition that actually once you've extracted the materials out of the ground, making sure that we're, we're taking a sustainable approach and how we can shift the sector to start looking at that. Uh, we have our Technology Developer Accelerator Program, so TDAP, which again is those startups and those spin-outs to make sure we're supporting uh, the innovation and the disruptors coming through 
uh, our national network theme, which is the linkage between the communities. So again, pulling some of our academic community to work with industry, again, across some of the sectors to see that cross fertilization. Technology trends, um, they are responsible for delivering the um, automated council roadmap. So looking across the vehicle types and also the technology types to really highlight what is coming down the road. You know, there, there are crystal ball gazes. And again, you know, really trying to influence some of the strategy from the OEMs and the tier ones and to make sure the supply chain is there with addressing some of the challenges. And the last thing uh, is our international events activities where we support the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy on really championing some of those UK businesses and um, internationally. So we take them as part of the UK government pavilion and really introduce them to look at some opportunity. Um, obviously, it's something that we've seen over the last year been rather quieter, um, but I'm delighted that it is starting to pick up. And, and even with last year, you know, I, I was amazed at how many hybrid events, um, well, actually online events, sorry, not hybrid events, but online events um, there were. And, and there was some challenging with the networking, I think. I don't think anyone quite got that right. Um, but yes, yeah, really, really good um, engagement there. Uh, so since 2013, over 400 organisations um, engaged in um, 170 projects. And, and really to me, and it's come across today already, is, is that safeguarding and the creating of jobs. So 50,000 so far, which is a really important aspect of this that I wanted to touch on. So that's a little bit of an introduction. So in terms of um, the, the state of the nation, if you like, um, I wanted to start off with this. So this is the, the International Energy um, Agency. So they, they estimate that currently there's around 34 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide from fuel use. And over the next 29 years, we've got the mammoth task of trying to get that to zero. Um, currently, the transport sector is around 21% of this, um, with cars and vans actually pushing out around three quarters um, of that in terms of the on-road emissions part of that. Um, we also have another chunk that's not often considered, and that's under the industrialization heading, which really adds another sort of 4% in terms of total CO2, which is for that production and supply chain of, of those cars and vans. So pre-pandemic uh, 2019, the global sales for most vehicles is around 93 million units, and just 2 million of those were plug-in EVs. So really, again, it's shifts in, in where that buying and that, that sales has got to come from. Next, I wanted just to touch on uh, the government's 10 point plan. So really, you know, the UK government set the, set the pace for decarbonisation of transport and in some ways, some would say leading the world globally. Um, point four really is where we obviously have our focus um, with, the, with the auto sector. And really um, from the work that we've been doing um, around the spending review and engagement with the industry is, you know, there's key, three key aspects here and that's supporting the OEMs in their transition, um, delivering innovation across the ecosystem, and thirdly, making sure there's a robust and resilient electric vehicle supply chain that can be scaled and scaled at pace is a key aspect of this. Um, I think the key here is, you know, great ideas will not move the dial on decarbonisation. It's about the commercialisation and getting those vehicles on the road to take the place of the most recent technology. Um, but also a lot of the work impacts also on, on point five, so moving people and goods, and actually, you know, the buses and the heavy duty vehicles are a big part of the moving goods and services that we've all become accustomed to with you know, every home delivery, you know, usually a call and surprise maybe doorbells wrong yet on this call, um, but somebody's getting something delivered at home, that, that can be a challenge. Um, and then also point two, the hydrogen. The government obviously released their hydrogen strategy um, earlier this year. And actually how do we how do we support that? And Tony mentioned uh, the work that Sarah's Power are doing around the ceramics piece, but there's also a, a great uh, Midland space company with intelligent energy and, and the work that they're doing in terms of leading the way with fuel cell development. So again, a real opportunity for the UK and that we have both in terms of um, key industry in that area, but also a lot of the research that's going on in our university. There's absolutely fantastic amount of our opportunity. Next, I wanted to just touch on the global demand um, and how it may look. Now, bear in mind, this is just uh, passenger cars, but it's essentially by 2030, it's seven times the amount of vehicles that we currently have will have, will have to have some sort of electrification on board. Um, and this is, this is a real, real challenge in terms of how we manage it. Um, and I think one of the key things for the UK to think of, and, and particularly the different regions, is at the moment, you know, our sector you know exports 
um, 80% of our cars and 60% of our commercial vehicles to 150 worldwide markets. So that's, you know, obviously with a lot of internal combustion engine, but again, how do we sustain that growth and transition that growth? Um, because I think the UK, you know, for the auto sector, it's 30% of the, of the UK's export value. So really transitioning those businesses to think of how they can um, change their processes, but still use their skills into the other, other technologies, but also transitioning the skills, you know, we've, we're seeing a, a, a great challenge in terms of the amount of electrical and electronic engineers that we, we don't have in, in the landscape at the moment, so really helping, again, make sure that those skills are developed in line with it. In terms of a review from the last year, um, this is a snapshot of our projects and I've had to remove some of the numbers against the graph, um, but it was really, really positive, is, is what I can say. You know, usually whenever ever there's a, a recession or something, it's the investment in research and development that gets cut. Um, so it was really, really um, positive to see that whilst, you know, we saw a quarter of, of people uh, furloughed, actually the majority of the projects stayed on track and kept going. And that was really, really positive. Um, and we kept working with them and seeing how we could manage them. Many of the uh, manufacturers themselves sort of shifted from their two shift pattern to their four shift pattern. Um, and actually probably some of the, the worst hit ones that I think of our projects were some of the universities um, and due to the, the access to their labs. Um, but actually what it meant was the projects could keep, keep going uh, because they, they it meant they actually wrote up a lot of the research that potentially they may be left to the latter stage of the project so uh, so that that actually meant that we could still keep supporting and providing the funding to keep those projects going so that was that was a, a positive thing um really um and again it was something that that we, we we kept on and another thing that i wanted to say is it wasn't all doom and gloom you know we saw the automotive manufacturers step up and transition from their business to help with the production of ppe um but also um it, through discussions with government we kept the funding going you know, the recognition that it still needed to be out there. And, and one of the projects that we did, uh, which is detailed there on the, on the left-hand side, that's 16.5 million, was uh, for the Advanced Boots Market Demonstrator Competition. So this was a fast start competition uh, to encourage UK industry and the sector to keep investing in R&D during the pandemic. Um, and it meant the acceleration of the transition to these zero emission vehicles. So the project for us to develop physical demonstrators to show how their product or process could be brought to market at pace. And delighted actually that you know 12 of these projects will be on display um, next week at the Senex Low Carbon Vehicles Park, Low Carbon Vehicle Show um, in Millbrook. And really outstanding in terms of then pulling through that technology at pace. And again, great representation from across the region with AVC, JLR, ABL, Delta Motorsport uh, involved in many of those projects, but also a lot of the academic representation. So I think you know, Nottingham are involved in one of the projects in Loughborough. So again, great Midlands representation in, in keeping the auto sector going and innovation going. Um, so it was, it was really good. And I think that, you know, that was a key aspect of this is the the commitment from the government to the sector was recognised that we needed to keep everyone going and I think the sector responded really well and again the information from your report shows that and um, I think that the sector is, is, is bouncing back and, and sustaining its growth. Um, but really just to switch to the opportunities in, in the essence of time and I think one of the things that you know the UK has to offer is its great funding landscape you know, particularly within the auto sector at the moment, you know, we have ourselves that focus at, at that later stage TRL level to really look at the application readiness and industrialization of scale, but to pull through some of those innovations, you know, we work very closely with the Faraday Battery Challenge and driving electric revolution at focus on power electronics and e-machines to again join some of those dots. And we do a lot of signposting between one another to make sure that things aren't falling through the gap. And actually that you're encouraging that disruption and, and making it sort of come to fruition as fast as we can possibly make. So really I just wanted to sort of touch on this last one and I think this will resonate with, with what a number of the other speakers have said is there's a, there's a key challenge within the sector here is you know we have to have the availability of the product and the technology and the new vehicles to shift this. Um, to do this you need the consumers to have the confidence to want to buy the vehicles and for them to have the confidence to buy the vehicles, the infrastructure needs to be in place to make that change and understand that they're not going to end up with range anxiety. And, and all of these three elements are slightly chicken and egg, um, but they're all needed to deliver on the net zero agenda. 
but to to deliver on that it, it hits in you know to, to what tony and mike and john have all said is that you know we need to continually invest in innovation you know that is a key part of it but not only that we need to have access to the materials and have a robust supply chain you know some of the challenges were mentioned around the semiconductor industry with john at the start um, but also access to some of those critical materials you know some of those um rare earth in the in that are in our electric machines will need to be there and also some of the challenges of extracting materials from around the globe that are, are, are well addressed so that's a key aspect but also making sure we develop the right standards and, and regulations to ensure we've got those products to market and, and that to me is, is kind of the key point and i think from from my side of it and for, definitely from what i've heard from the other sectors as well there's a there's a great opportunity here to, to sort of develop and deliver on those jobs and the investment you know that hopefully will take the uk from being a, a science superpower to an industrial superpower um, and making those strides towards net zero philippa that was an excellent overview and, and canter through so thank you uh, very much for that in the essence of time can i thank our brilliant speakers um, especially John and the support from BDO. We wouldn't be able to do this deep dive into the regions for so many years without BDO support. Um, and Make UK is here absolutely to try and facilitate those connections, signposts, to make sure that um, we've got that true collaboration taking, uh, taking place. Within the Midlands, we're blessed. We've got brilliant facilities, amazing organisations. Um, we've got the Made Smarter uh, adoption programme being rolled out in the West Midlands at the moment. So please, if you're a SME, a, a small business employing up to 250 people, don't miss out, get involved. We've got uh, brilliant catapult centres. We boast the most catapult centres in uh, the whole of the UK. Tremendous universities and also lots of networking groups have come together uh, to be able to foster that spirit of cross collaboration. Um, don't forget to join our webinar for the quarter three results on the 21st of September. And I really hope that we'll see you coming to our regional manufacturing dinner on the 13th of October. Philippa, it's close to home, will be at the, uh, the University of Warwick, a, uh, a magnificent venue there. But we hope you leave today with a very positive sense about how Midlands manufacturing has been doing, but actually what the opportunity for the future is. So thank you for attending and uh, have a good day, everyone. Bye bye.